This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond on a rather chilly day here in Glasgow. It's the economy, stupid. Remember that? That was the phrase that propelled the Clinton government into the White House. And of course, no doubt it'll be the economy that finally settles the constitutional argument here in Scotland. With that in mind, we start today a two-part series on the economy. First of all, we speak to Professor Richard Murphy of Irish name, but living in England and an expert on monetary and fiscal economics. We'll then also speak to Professor Danny Blanchflower of the famous Ivy League University Dartmouth College. And as usual, we'll have your favourite segments this week, your tweets, messages and emails and of course, Scotland's hidden heroes. But first, over to Alex, who's speaking with Professor David Blanchflower, latterly of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. I'm now joined by uh, Professor David Blanchflower of Dartmouth College, but formerly, once upon a time, of the Bank of England Monetary Policy Committee. Danny, welcome to the Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Great to chat with you again, Alex. It's, uh, I've been here again. I've been here before. Um, a lot of what's happening now certainly has the feeling of what happened around 2008. And I recall... June, July 2008, it was all about inflation's 5.5% and inflation is going to rise like mad. And what we've got to do is we've got to deal with inflation because there's no recession coming. And here we are again. <laughs> well, there's an element of deja vu in all uh, economics, of course, uh, of course. Uh, Danny. But can, well, first, that's a broad question. What is this infectious disease affecting Western central banks, which leads them to believe that high interest rates are a, a, some sort of cure for what was obviously a bout of cost push inflation. What's going on? Well, I think they're living in a world of the 1970s and believing that all that matters is inflation. But actually, they haven't actually observed the evidence and they certainly haven't walked the streets of Glasgow or Edinburgh and realised what's going on. So the evidence in some sense, and the government has set this up now, sort of said, don't care about recession, all we care about is inflation. But the evidence, it turns out, is that for ordinary people, unemployment is much worse. We have lots of evidence that perhaps, so if you think, how much hurt is there from a one percentage point rise in unemployment compared to a one percentage point rise in inflation? The answer is six to 10 times worse in terms of unemployment. So they don't seem to understand that. And in many senses, you think, I mean, listen to Hugh Pym today saying, you know, we should raise him, raise rates and keep them there forever. Hugh, well, Pym being, sorry, Hugh Pym being the, well, actually somebody in the Bank of England with an economics degree, is that correct? Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. But also it seems to think this is a jolly good idea, presumably because unemployment is not going to impact him. Uh, what he does is he's going to raise rates to hurt everybody else. So, so people on the margins, if you like, are going to lose, lose their jobs, they're going to have lower income, and they can't afford to pay their mortgages. So it's recessions are, recessions are priced worth paying for everybody else, because I don't like inflation, so I want to get interest rates up. So it's, if you like, the huge disconnect between what happens to ordinary people and what happens to central bankers. And obviously, they've got it wrong. I mean, this is about the data is that recessions are much worse. And today we're seeing data this, this morning, data coming out saying house prices are now down 5%, generated and caused by Hugh Pym and his other pals. Um, and we've also seen a global manufacturing decline. 
data out this morning showing that UK manufacturing is in significant recession. So this is, so the question is, how far do you want to go? And the chances are we've got a lot further to go. And, and now is the time when actually they should be cutting rates, not raising them. That's where we are. So this is a disconnect. Ordinary people are not represented on the Bank of England. But what is the objective then? Let me, let's take the, the Bank of England uh, Monetary Policy Committee. You've got uh, Andrew Bailey, the governor with no economics degree. You've got Hugh Pym, his economic advisor, with an economics degree. You've got the Monetary Policy Committee altogether. I mean, they must have some objective in mind. I mean, they, they can't believe that increasing interest rates are going to impact on inflation in the near term at least. So what is the objective to have interest rates as, so high? Well... I mean, I was in Scotland a, a month or so ago to try and celebrate the tercentenary of the birth of Adam Smith. And Adam Smith basically argued that the purpose of economics out of presumably central banking is to improve the wealth of nations. Um, unlikely that that's what actually the central bankers in London are trying to do. I mean, I think what they're trying to do is, as I say, they think it's all about inflation. But let's think about the background of these folks. They all live in London and the southeast. They actually were either um, officials at the Bank of England or at the Treasury or worked for Goldman Sachs. Uh, you and I, I recall, some years ago, had a conversation about <laughs> representation on that committee. And the obvious thing you might want to do is actually include people who understand about the real world. So think of a very strong argument for a representation of people, from, of someone from Scotland, from Northern Ireland, from Wales, from manufacturing, from... Birmingham. I mean, none of those folks appear to have even ever gone north of the Watford Gap. And so I think the answer is that they're completely out of touch with the real world. Um, and, 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 and you only have to listen to what the governor of the Bank of England says. He says, oh, the solution is the workers can take the strain. Well, what about the shareholders? What about the CEOs who've actually done so great over time? So this is a real disconnect. Um, and I suspect going forward, this is going to have to change. Well, it would have been interesting 10 years and more ago if there'd been a Scottish representative on the MPC, the Monetary Policy Committee, you'd have had somebody to, to second your position on, on reducing interest well, rates and looking at the real economy. But is it because, I mean, is this why you developed the, uh, the, uh, the theory, the science of, uh, of walkabout economics, which is designed to say, let's talk right. about the economics as it impacts on the... The, the man in the Clapham omnibus or the woman in Socky Hall Street in Glasgow. Was that, was that what you had right. in mind? Well, that's exactly what I have in mind. I mean, think about, in a sense, the people at the Bank of England represent the, the city of London. They represent banks. Um, they represent uh, the financial sector. And obviously, the effects of the financial sector have been really big. And I like to do what I call the economics of walking about, which is go and ask people, go and ask people about what they think is going on. Talk to ordinary people, they know. If you say to ordinary people, what do you think is gonna to happen to the unemployment rate? Turns out they're much better than economists at forecasting it. And then you say to employers, what do you think is going on? Um, and it turns out that has really important information. But the, 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 in a sense, you have to think about what, what's, what's going on right now is the central bank represents employers, particularly in the city of London and the financial markets. The question is who represents Scotland and who represents the interests of the people of Scotland in the cities and in the rural areas in Shetland and in, as I say, in, in Dornoch. And the answer is really nobody, because what you have here is a recession caused by the actions of the government and the Bank of England, and obviously Brexit is part of it. Um, and there's much worse to come because the effects have still not been felt of the last dozen rate rises that the banks put in. So I think utter incompetence was what happened in 2008, why they missed the Great Recession, and, and essentially where they are today as well. Well, let's see if we can put the counter point of view to try and get some uh, explanation and rationality behind this decision making. Is, is it possible that from the, the view of the Bank of England, the, the most important industry uh, in the United Kingdom is, is banking and finance uh, and right through all its derivative, derivative stages. Uh, and therefore, if in the words of Churchill, you make finance proud, even if you make the rest of industry poor, 
uh, on aggregate, that will still be a good thing for the UK economy. It's what, like, what's good for the city of London must be good for the UK. Would that be well, one rationale? <coughs> Alex, imagine if you said that in June 2008, as many people did. So what happened was that the financial sector, which everyone concentrated on, collapsed. And that brought the global economy down. Right. So the, 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 the subprime markets, the, the way in which these financial folks had invested and over invested and, and, that, and the UK, had, if you like, got too big a financial sector. That's what brought the global economy down and which countries in the world suffered the most. The answer was the ones with giant financial sectors, the UK, the US and Iceland. So essentially what you need to do, I mean, you, as, a, as, a, I recall, as a minister, you spent a lot of time, first minister, you spent a lot of time thinking about, we need to diversify the portfolio. We need to be able to, you know, take some of the, if a shock comes to the financial sector, we want to be able to um, sit, dis, have, have a disparate uh, um, s s set of industries. So what's happened is the UK has concentrated too much on the financial sector and is now beholden to it when the financial sector is up great and when it's down we generated the greatest recession we've seen in a hundred years so i suspect that's probably not a great argument and it's certainly not really an argument that helps workers if you look now yeah maybe you want to focus on the financial sector but real wages of workers have not risen in a very long time so the ordinary person has actually not benefited from that the boys in the city of london and a hedge fund have done great but the person walking the Socky Hall Street or riding the Clapham Omnibus or walking down Whitechapel Road haven't, haven't felt any of that. Hence Trump, hence Brexit, hence Le Pen. So this is about rising inequality and a world of economics that doesn't help ordinary people. So if you were a, a Scottish First Minister, let, let, let's say you, uh, Professor Blanford, were one of my successors as Scottish First Minister, <laughs> What within the constraints of a devolved parliament and uh, administration, what would you be trying to, to do about this situation? Well, obviously, this, the, in a sense, given the structure of things at the moment, there are limited things that one can do. I think the biggest argument essentially now um, is that Brexit is a major negative on Scotland and on the UK and Brexit that Scotland didn't vote for and you opposed. I mean, I think the only question, you, the only answer, and I was, uh, I've been thinking a lot about this recently, what explains the very bad inflation performance of the UK against everywhere else? And you sit and you try and think of any explanation, and in the end, you end up saying, this is about Brexit. This is about Brexit strategy. It's about energy strategy. Just as an example, France, why has France not had such a big rise in inflation as the, as the UK has the answer of 70% of the UK, France's energy is produced by nuclear. You have this energy policy which insulates you from price rises of energy driven by the Russian war. So there's, there's, it, there's energy policy, obviously, but Brexit seems particularly important. But I think you, you want to try and insulate the, the Scottish people as far as you can and protect them from the EDC coming from the Bank of England of rate rises. So uh, the stories that you did, which was keep, keep um, student fees down for my son-in-law who went to a Scottish university and didn't have to pay fees because of you, although my daughter was there and I was paying them as a foreigner. But that and obviously things like uh, making sure that the bridge, there's tolls not paid on bridge. But basically you've got to protect your people against the slings and arrows. And these slings and arrows right now are being generated by Hugh Pym, by Andrew Bailey, by uh, other people on the MPC who, are, who have never walked the streets, the, the Socky Hall Street, or been, or been to the University of Glasgow as well, and, 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 and thought about how the real world is. So I think that's, that's a big part of it. But you have to say, why is Britain much worse than everywhere else? And, and added to it, utter incompetence from the government's strategy and policy, trust and trustonomics has ended up meaning that borrowing costs in the UK are higher than they were then and are higher than any other country in the Western world. So I, I would argue that Alex Salmon has got, has got to try and, with, uh, and his successor has got to try and have a set of economic advisors that have policies that help people and not hurt people. Thinking about the logical conclusion of where the, the Bank of England is now, I mean, are, are they seriously suggesting that even after inflation, 
comes down, which is going to come naturally down to something like 2-3% uh, over the next wee while, that they should sustain a high level of real interest rates. And if they're doing that or suggesting that, and that does seem to be the suggestion coming from Mr Pym, uh, uh, what's the objective? What are they trying to achieve? Hard to know. They're trying to create a giant recession um, and raise unemployment. I mean, the reality, though, is if you're Keir Starmer and, let's, and you're looking forward, I mean, obviously what he's been doing right now is trying to say, I'm going to wait and see what mess it is that I inherit from you. But if you then get elected and this is the strategy that the Bank of England is going for, the Bank of England the Act allows the, allows the new prime minister to actually scrap them and to change their remit. So obviously, in a sense, that's a big deal. I mean, you might imagine if I was advising you as the, as the prime minister, I would say if you, my first thing would be fire the government of the Bank of England day one. I mean, I don't think that would have a negative effect on the markets. I think what they're trying to do is they care about, they care about savers. They don't care about borrowers. And they care about banks who basically they, that's who they represent. So this is not, this is not a, a Bank of England which is fit for purpose. So I mean, I know that Sir Keir Stammer is an avid viewer of this uh, this program. So if he, if, he, if, he, if he designs a new structure, can, can we take it that uh, uh, that you might be a candidate for governor of the Bank of England to make a return to the Bank of England? This time uh, to have a governor with an economics degree, would you would you would you consider well, that? No, no, Alex. Well, do, I wouldn't wish that on anybody. I remember actually. I remember I was at the end of 2008 and Gordon Brown, who appointed me to the committee, called me up and he said, Danny, I'm really sorry about appointing you to that awful job. <laughs> it's, not a, it's not a great job, Alex. It really isn't. Um, but isn't that just the, the question of being a, a member or being the governor? I mean, I always got into enormous trouble with... Uh, with the SNP until I became leader, and then things were much, much easier for me. Now, wouldn't that be the same with you and the Bank of England? If, you know, it's bad enough being oh. a member of the MPC, but once you're governor, you can change things. Well, there's obviously that, and I think the appointment of a governor really is crucial. And I think Mark Carney was actually a very, a very good governor. And actually, you think now, what was his opportunity? What was his next best alternative employment? That's always a good test. He's actually just become chairman of Bloomberg. I mean, Mark Carney was a pretty darn good choice, I have to argue, I have to say, in the sense that Andrew Bailey's turned out to be a terrible choice. It's clear that having a governor of the Bank of England who understands what's happening to ordinary people is crucial. Mervyn King didn't understand that or care about that. Bailey clearly doesn't care about that. Um, having a governor that represents ordinary people seems crucial. I, I ain't doing that job. I'm really not. I'm happy to advise them. I'm happy to explain, you know, how we how, how we got as as my friend Richard Murphy's trying to been thinking. We, we we want, but we want to have representation on a committee that cares about ordinary people and understands that inflation isn't the only thing. I mean, let's just say one more thing. So there's a lot of discussion right now about the two percent target, and the Bank of England has been given a target of two percent. Well, why? The answer is, well, they just kind of, some guy in New Zealand years ago decided that 2% would be a good idea. It's nothing more sophisticated than that. And actually, there's very strong grounds, and um, Paul Krugman and others have been arguing it, that actually you could raise the target, which actually doesn't mean then that you don't have to raise rates so much. You could raise it to three very e easily. And I would actually argue that that would be a sensible thing the Labour Party could actually do. Um, Gordon Brown set the target initially with the RPI and then moved it to the CPI. There's no reason set in heaven or in the world to say you have to have 2% inflation. What you, what you need to have is inflation that doesn't vary too much. So I think that would be a perfectly reasonable thing that would help the Scottish economy a lot. Uh, two more questions, Professor Blanche. For, in, firstly, the, the Bank of England isn't alone in pursuing their high interest rate policy. I mean, this seems to be an affliction which is uh, affecting most of the Western world bankers. Is there something about high interest rates which appeals to the sense of orthodoxy, that they're more comfortable in a world of real interest rate, positive real interest rates, than they were in what they would see as the aberration uh, when interest rates were negative in real terms? Well, 
central bankers represent banks. I mean, the good way to look at it in the United States is that <clears throat> half the people on the committee who vote on, on interest rates are simply appointed by the banks. We have governors on that committee. There has not been a single dissent by a governor on the Fed since the days of Alan Greenspan. So there is an issue, I think, which is a deep issue, which is that these folks represent banks. And what you have is groupthink. You don't have the person from Scotland who you know, may not have been a banker. He's going to represent the views of the Scottish people. I mean, the, the, first, the first minister of Scotland probably should have the right to appoint whoever they want to the Bank of England's committee. I mean, that, presume, I mean that, that would be a choice that that first minister makes, be it an economist or not. That seems to me what we should be seeing um, in, the, in these appointments. And all we basically have, a central bank is appointed by banks and banks like high interest rates, but people don't. <laughs> Ordinary people don't. And the, where's the voice representing the people of Scotland saying, well, you may think it's great for you guys who are savers there, and it may be great for the bank, but what about young people? What about people who, own, who have a mortgage? Because presumably the central bank don't have a mortgage. So, so it's about... It's about representation of ordinary people. And of course, you might look at the polls. I mean, the polls, the government who's been doing this and supporting the central bank and telling them the inflation is everything are getting nuked in the polls. Um, so, we, so we will see. But I think this is about the well-being of ordinary people who have basically struggling. And, the, and Hugh Pym and various other members of the Bank of England seem to not care at all about the well-being of ordinary people and I think Alex Salmon and Danny Blanchflat do. Well, finally then, Danny, you, you've just come back from your fact-finding mission uh, to Scotland, back, back to Dartmouth College. If Scotland, as you say, needs a, a new trading policy with Europe, restoring our position in the single mm -hmm. market, if we need a, a new monetary policy to get out from under the clutches of the Bank of England, and a new fiscal policy, as, uh, uh, as, uh, as Richard Murphy always tells us both, and a new industrial policy, doesn't that, uh, doesn't that kind of add up to Scotland needing a new political settlement in, uh, in these islands? Well, but prob probably does. I mean, I always love coming back to, to Scotland. The only thing I always find is that two things, Scotland's cold, and once again, British Airways lost my luggage. So I was there for a week and my bags arrived the day before I left. So, th so that, but yes, I think we do have to think about, I mean, think about how successful has, has economics been and how, how, how well have people done? And people are entitled to say, you know, how, how, how am I doing today compared with, let's say in 2010, when this Tory government took over? And the answer is it's been a disaster. And people are entitled to say, I expect governments to try and make me better mm -hmm. off. The purpose of economics that we started from is to improve the wealth of nations. And basically what we've seen is that this government, especially over the last two or three years or so, has actually made the wealth of the Scottish people worse and the well-being of the Scottish people worse. So, so I think fundamental change is needed. Richard Murphy's talked about it. I've tried to think about it. But what we need are policies that represent ordinary people and not bankers. Professor David Blanchford, thank you so much for joining me on Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Welcome back. You remember last week we looked back at the Edinburgh Festival Fringe where Alex spoke to arts correspondent for The Scotsman, Brian Ferguson. And, uh, this year and last year the demand to, to get 
at way, way over 3,000 shows wanting to come back. You know, that, that demand is there, so it's how the city manages that demand is quite tricky. But I think overall that the enthusiasm from, uh, you know, artists and performers and companies to put on shows, but also the enthusiasm for audiences to kind of embrace the return of the Fringe um, has, been, has been terrific, I think. However, free speech advocates Ian McQuarter and Dame Baroness Claire Fox were worried that the free speech police may have taken over the enjoyment of the Edinburgh Fringe Festival. The most striking case was Graham Linehan, the uh, Father Ted author this week, who was successively banned from numerous uh, fringe venues and eventually had to actually set himself up outside the Scottish Parliament. It was the only place in Edinburgh he was able to conduct his fringe, view, uh, fringe show, which was part of a wider uh, show by comedians, I, I should point out. Now, I mean, this is, I mean, all credit to Hollywood, actually, for uh, standing up for free speech, because nobody else would. Um, and this is, in, in, as you rightly say, the city of the Enlightenment, this is deeply depressing, but it's doubly depressing that this is the fringe. Because the fringe was supposed to be where you saw edgy, far out, controversial comedy, where anything was supposed to go, and where we, in the past, it was always a great defender of freedom of speech against censorship, against censorship by local councillors, against censorship by the laws uh, and the Lord Chancellor. And right from the start, the fringe set itself against censorship and it's depressing to find it's turned on its head. Disappointingly, uh, we, I feel let down that those of us who are, you know, in some way associated with the left in the past and so on, now have to almost apologise for the fact that it's people on the left who were doing the cancelling because, you know, we all felt very comfortable when it was the likes of Mary Whitehouse or, you know, those, those nasty Tories closing people down or, you know, the big wigs in society not wanting to hear a, a, offensive opinions. But when it's our own people, people who should actually stand in the tradition of saying that we, every oppressed person needs the right to free speech, that every great social change was achieved because ordinary people had that freedom to argue back, then it's very disappointing that it's that uh, group that are associated with um, closing down comedy in this instance, artistic freedom more generally, and really being puritanical in what we can and can't hear, see and laugh at. Meanwhile, unconcerned by this apparent stramash were the star pupils of Broxburn Academy, Lena, Sarah and Lucy. Elena, what about you? I think really similar to Lucy, I just, there isn't that many opportunities I think for young people to really express their views and I think this was a really fun way to do it because it wasn't really like this kind of hostile politics that you usually see on the news. It was really fun, easy, everyone was really kind, making jokes in their speeches. Um, I think it was really fun and it's definitely an amazing opportunity for young people. And Tina, did it give you, obviously everyone has their own image of what politicians might be like in real life. You've got Alex Salmond on one side, former First Minister of Scotland, David Davis on the other side, you know, a seasoned politician, been in the House of Commons for decades. It can be quite nerve wracking, you know, engaging with these people. Did you find it a very comfortable and easy atmosphere and did they help you along with your, with your arguments beforehand? Yeah, they were all so nice. It wasn't like speaking to a politician, it was just like speaking to like a normal person, which I think was like crazy because it's like not how you would expect them to be. And the audience, of course, they were, it was uh, a late night show, well, a late evening show at George Square Gardens at the Spiegel tent at the Palais du Variety. So people were rather loud and noisy. Uh, did you find that, that they were supportive of you though in that environment? Yeah, I thought the audience, both nights were absolutely amazing absolutely loved them and it was such a great like confidence boost hearing all the applause and your parents were they were they able to i don't know if they were able to come and see this show or if you're able to tell them about it they must be extremely proud definitely i mean they were able to get the sh get to see the show which was really great because obviously we got free tickets which is really helpful as well but they loved it they thought it was amazing and because they've never had the chance to like come and see us debate before because normally it's a more closed off setting whereas because this was more open and it was like a show it was really great so they really enjoyed being able to watch and now for your reaction to last week's show here are some of your tweets messages and emails howard says as a scot living in australia i obviously couldn't go to see the eyes have it Will you be making a video of the debates available on YouTube? I'd love to see the debates. Well, Howard, I've got some good news for you coming up. So keep watching the shows and we'll let you know when you can next see The Eyes Have It. 
Paul says, this was a great show. Great to see a wee bit of the eyes have it on show too. Lots of good discussion throughout. JKR says, this show is quickly becoming my favourite weekly update. History, politics, finances, industry, our possible future. All highlighted in a fun, easily understood way. Well done to all of you. Well, thanks very much. Peem says, Dunoon Grammar School won the world's best school prize for community collaboration in 2022. It'd be great to see them in a future event. Cheers for another great show. Keep up the good work. Well, indeed, I will make sure that Dunoon Grammar School gets an invite next time round. Charles says, once again, a refreshing, vibrant, intelligent, sensitive finger on the Pulse programme. Thank you to all concerned. I, the eyes of insight, of independence, need it. Want it, and with such a dynamic, will win it. May the juice of Bruce flow once again through the veins of Scotland. And finally, Scotia with a show idea says, we really need a show guide on how Scotland's energy, resource, wealth and material food experts are recorded and further how this is distorted via the Westminster machine. Something so simple, as Scotia put it, that the dugs in the street would understand. And now over to Alex and his favourite section of the show, Scotland's Hidden Heroes in association with Thigh Scott magazine. I grew up in a household where the, the names David Livingston and Eric Liddell were spoken about and revered almost hushed tones. David Livingston not because he was a great explorer, Eric Liddell not because he was an Olympic gold medalist, but both of them because they'd given their life to, as missionaries to, to enlighten and lighten the areas of darkness in the world, whether these be in Africa or China. There's one woman who stands uh, comparison with these great men, and that's Mary Mitchell Slessor. Her family was from Aberdeenshire, but Mary was brought up in the, the slums of Dundee, and by the time in the 1870s she was inspired to become a missionary, her Presbyterian faith drove her to, to Africa. She was in her late 20s and a, a skilled jute worker. But Mary had a, a further mission in mind. Mary carried her mission to the Cross River State area of Nigeria. That's in the southeast of the country, jutting out into the Atlantic. It was a, a place in the 1870s where male missionaries feared to tread. Uh, many of them had met their, their fate and their end in that area, but that was of no deterrent whatsoever to, to Mary Slessor. And for 40 years, she carried out her mission there, becoming known as the, the White Queen of the Okeyong people. She saved literally thousands of uh, youngsters uh, from infanticide, which was one of the common practices of the, of the tribes at the time, particularly when twins were born. And she brought the, the message of hope and religion and faith to these people and devoted four decades of her life until her death in 1915. You know, we're in a secular society in Scotland now. Uh, and of course, there is a suspicion among most people of uh, those who purvey their religion to, to other people, so, or to assume that their ways are, are superior to that of a, another culture. We're all suspicious of the imperial aspect of uh, missionary zeal. It was a cover for empire in, in many cases, and that's a, a rightful scepticism. But that scepticism shouldn't change the admiration for the, the faith, the endurance, of people like Mary Slessor. She devoted 40 years to saving children in Africa, to trying teaching people in the, in the light as, as she saw it. Uh, no, no task was, was too difficult, no uh, undertaking was, was too dangerous. She uh, went ahead with that over a period of 40 years. She had an extraordinary effect. She was beloved uh, among the local tribes and she was revered back in Scotland which is why Mary Slessor is a worthy addition to our pantheon of Scotland's hidden heroes.
And now back to the theme of this week's show, which is the economy and Scotland. And over to Professor Richard Murphy, who has some rather interesting things to say about girls. I'm now delighted to be joined by an Irish citizen, English-based, but a keen student of Scottish economic affairs, Professor Richard Murphy. Welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Thank you, Alex. Glad to be here. Tell us, Richard, first, what's happening in the, in the Scottish economy right now? Nothing. I mean, obviously, some things are going on, but if we're talking about news, if we're talking about change, if we're talking about hope, if we're talking about expectation of things getting better, nothing can be happening in the Scottish economy because the Bank of England has basically taken away all hope. And that's deliberate. It wants to create a recessionary environment. It has created a recessionary environment by pushing up interest rates to 5.25%. We know that that's creating massive pressure on lots of households who simply can't make ends meet. We know that there are households who are wondering how to literally pay the mortgage and may not be able to. And we know that there are many businesses that are under significant stress as well. While some are doing particularly well, oil and gas, of course, is doing rather nicely. Bankers are doing well. And so, too, are food retailers. And the evidence is very clear on that. We also know that a lot of other businesses who are utterly dependent upon buying fuel and basic raw materials and so on are doing really poorly right now. So overall, the Scottish economy is in a difficult, if not dire, position totally out of its own control, and yet subject to the whims of bankers in London, 400 plus miles away, who are saying, you must suffer, and to suffer Scotland is. But surely Governor Bailey, Governor Andrew Bailey, is saying that this uh, pressure on interest rates uh, is necessary to squeeze inflationary pressures out of the economy. We just have to take the medicine and, and hope we feel better at some point. I know you don't believe that, Alex, and neither do I. And the reason why is very simple. There's no evidence that it actually works in the case of the type of inflation we've now got. Let's be clear. The inflation we've got has arisen for two fundamental reasons. One was the whole process of reopening from COVID, which gave rise to all sorts of disrupted supply chains and shortages of supply in some area. Well, look, that problem's gone. Near it, damn it, it's over. And then, of course, there was the consequence of the war in Ukraine. Now, we know that the great many raw material prices inflated dramatically after that war began. I mean, you've only got to look at the charts on prices of oil and wheat and other major raw materials on something like Trading Economics website, and you'll see that. You'll also see that in many cases, the prices have returned to normal now. Now, they didn't return to normal because Andrew Bailey put up interest rates. They were utterly irrelevant to the value at which those commodities were traded. They returned to normal because people realised that, in fact, the war in Ukraine was not going to disrupt the supply of many materials and essential supplies in the way that markets anticipated at first. I always draw an analogy to the fact that we had that toilet roll crisis at the start of the COVID era. Everybody panicked that there would be no loo rolls left in the whole of the country and bought them off every shelf they could find. And that's exactly what oil and wheat and food and oh yeah, all sorts of other things, fertilizer traders did right at the beginning of the war in Ukraine. They pushed the, sky, uh, the prices through the roof because they thought there'd be no product. The same as toilet rolls were selling at silly prices on eBay. Now they're back to normal. We didn't need an interest rate rise to put the price of toilet rolls right. We didn't need an interest rate rise to put the price of wheat right. And yet, Andrew Bailey increased the interest rate. He increased the price of money. Just think about it for a minute. He actually increased prices to control inflation. That makes no sense. And that's what he did. And so what he did instead do was actually simply create this, what I call a recessionary environment. He's squashed spending power. He's squashed people's dis discretion of whatever they might have left over at the end of the month. He's put pressure on people in debt. And he says that will remove inflation by reducing demand. But demand was already low because we'd had the COVID crisis. So it was crazy. 
made no sense. Completely mad economics, bad economics. And it's been endorsed by the Tories and by Labour, let's be blunt. Rachel Reeves seems to be a big fan of it, and she may well be the next Chancellor of the Exchequer. But we have to remember, she's an ex-Bank of England person, so of course she buys the logic. Well, you, you say the toilet uh, roll crisis is over, but there, there's still a cupboard in the Salmond household that would testify differently. But let, let me just examine this for a second. I mean, we know Andrew Bailey famously doesn't have an economics degree, but he has plenty of people in the Bank of England who've you know, encountered economics at, at some point in their, uh, in their careers. There must be some sort of logic to, to what he's doing. He must believe that it's going to benefit someone by putting up interest rates. So, I mean, the, you know, he's not the Marquis de Sade of, of uh, economic policy. There must be some logic behind the position. What is it? Well, the logic, and it's shared by all central bankers, is that if they push up interest rates, they will basically reduce the amount of money that we've all got to spend. And by reducing the amount of money that we've all got to spend, prices will be forced down because markets, they believe, are effective communicators of demand, which is a, a, a hypothesis which has not stood the test of time, but they believe that they are. And as a result, they think that prices will be forced down. Now, that's just not what seems to be happening. And we know prices are already falling. Let's be clear, prices or the rate of change of prices is falling. Prices aren't falling, except for oil and gas and, and petrol prices are definitely falling. But most others, the rate of change is falling. So the rate of inflation is falling. But as I say, that's not because of what Andrew Bailey's done. Now, their theory looks great on a university blackboard or whiteboard or in a textbook or wherever else. But the reality is that this policy promoted by the world central bankers, and we're not alone in doing this policy, it's done by the European Central Bank, it's being done by the US Fed, it's not being done in Japan, and China's in a totally different place altogether, it's now got deflation. Let's remember, this is not a worldwide phenomenon anymore, it's a particular problem for Western countries right now of a particular type. But what those central bankers are trying to do is to basically bring pressure to bear on the borrowers in the economy because obviously interest rate rises can only impact the borrowers in an economy. Now, let's be clear about this. What they want to bring pressure on, therefore, are those who haven't got money, who've had to borrow money. But the corollary is that the lender, the person with money, is doing rather nicely. I mean, in fact, interest rates are rising. We've seen the government itself offer 6.2% on national savings and investment bonds very recently. Now, that's an extraordinary rate of interest to pay. Um, it's above the actual bank base rate. And that means that savers are going to be absolutely coining it, whilst people who are borrowing are going to be suffering enormously. What they're doing is increasing the divisions in society. Do I believe that's their deliberate aim? Yeah, actually, I do believe that is their deliberate aim. I believe there is here an aim to restore the pre-2008 world order as they saw it, which was, of course, heavily biased in favour of wealth. The negative rates of interest, the real negative rates of interest when you compare inflation and the rate of interest paid, since 2008 has been something they have greatly lamented because it has reduced in some senses the value of their earnings potential. They want that earnings potential restored. They don't want to see the value of their assets undermined. And so they're pushing this situation for all it's worth. Hugh Pill is the chief economist of the Bank of England, not a man for whom I have a great regard, little more regard than I have for Andrew Bailey. But he's now talking about trying to keep interest rates at the current level of 5.25% for some time to come. Now, that means that when inflation falls to around 2% or less, and the Bank of England is forecasting that by late 2024 or early 2025 at the latest, so we're going to be seeing inflation at under 2% and bank interest rates apparently at 5 plus percent, we're going to be paying 3% positive rates of interest. Now, that has not happened in the lifetime of most mortgage holders in the UK as a whole, let alone in Scotland. This is extraordinary and is a fundamental trickle-up economics policy. In other words, wealth is going to flow upwards by deliberate design of the Bank of England. And that's the last thing that Scotland needs. Well, there was a, a politician once who said that the trouble with central bankers 
is that they wanted to make finance too proud and industry too poor. But where does Scotland stand in all of this? I mean, Scottish ministers seem quite happy with the economy. They just talk about unemployment being low, employment, at least of the labour force that's left, seems pretty high. But the output figures tell a very different story, do they not? The output figures for Scotland are pretty poor. They're flatlining. Um, actually, during the course of much of 2023 to date, there's been no change or a decline. Um, and now people are yelling and saying, oh, look, Scotland, if the wind doesn't blow, then the output goes down because we're so heavily dependent upon renewable energy. Look, that's ridiculous. Um, first of all, don't put all your emphasis on one particular measure or one particular point in time. Um, the strength of renewable energy to Scotland is it's the basis for its future prosperity. So don't get upset that it's actually a little bit variable from day to day. The point about the Scottish economy is that actually ministers shouldn't be feeling that smug about it because they're not having almost any control over it. I mean, right now, it is true that official figures say that unemployment is low. But let's also be clear, those figures are a little dubious. Um, as I know, Danny Blanchflower, who's on your programme as well, is going to say, or if he hasn't, I will, the figures for, for self-employed data in there are basically guesswork and they suit governments, but we really don't know the true numbers. And there are some very serious problems with counting precisely who is and is not in work at present for all sorts of technical reasons. So feeling smug about the absolute numbers of people in employment isn't great when those people can't afford to meet their bills. So that's not good enough. And what is more, there's not enough investment. Fundamentally, let's come back to the key issue here. The government isn't investing. The Bank of England policy is preventing investment because of raising interest rates. The Scottish government can't do anything to affect that because it hasn't got the borrowing powers to deliver on it. And therefore, there's no process of innovation going on. Nobody should feel smug about that. Richard Murphy, you've been a, a sort of uh, one economist demolition factory of the GERS figures, the Government Expenditure and Revenue Statement for Scotland. In a nutshell, what's wrong with GERS? GERS is made up. It's make-believe. It's accounting for something that doesn't exist. There's supposedly some sort of government in Scotland that is responsible for everything. But there isn't. There's a Westminster government. There's a Holyrood government. There's local government. And there are even outsourced agencies. And they're added all together and put into GERS. And then apparently somebody's responsible for it. But the Secretary of State for Scotland isn't apparently, nor is the First Minister in Holyrood responsible, and certainly the local authorities aren't. So this is just a made-up statement which adds together a pile of numbers and says, Scotland's in trouble. But Holyrood isn't in trouble. Local authorities are balancing their books. So if it says anything, it says that Westminster's in trouble and has actually tried to dump costs on Scotland. But the truth is, the figures just make no sense. I describe these figures as crap, which is a name I made up for this. It stands for completely rubbish approximation. The accountancy term, I take it, Professor Murphy. Crap's an accountancy term. I call it a technical term. Yes. And it means that the figures for income are made up out of figures earned in Scotland. The figures for expenditure are out of payments for Scotland. The two don't even match. They're different. The tax paid on the expenditure for Scotland isn't credited to Scotland. Scotland isn't credited for all the financial flows which are measured in the southeast of England, but which come out of Scotland, like interest rents and everything else, for PFI payments even. So we're in an absurd situation where these numbers are designed to make Scotland look bad. What we should frankly do is set them aside, say enough of this nonsense, let's try to prepare some proper numbers which reflect the true economy of Scotland and what's really going on. And they would not show anything like the deficit that there is at present. They would show a deficit. There's nothing wrong with a government deficit. Governments should run deficits to stimulate economies, but they wouldn't show the absurd numbers that have been published of late. You've also been a, a strong advocate, Professor Murphy, of Scotland having its own currency. Again, in a nutshell, what, what are the arguments for a, an independent Scottish currency? Oh, one very simple argument at the moment, and that is that Scotland would not need to have a base rate of interest of 5.25%. It could reduce its base rate of interest and stimulate its economy, keep its people without the financial stress they're uh, suffering, let its business borrow at lower rate and grow itself out of the situation it's in, in a way that is impossible whilst we have 
interest rates imposed from London. At the moment, the Bank of England is making the case for a Scottish independent currency where different decisions can be made for the well-being of Scotland and not for the well-being of bankers and the rich in the southeast of England. And just one final question. In Scotland just now, where should we look for, for our economic inspiration? Should we look east to, to Norway or west to Ireland? What, what, what would be the, the model that, that, that Scotland should follow? And look, um, I, I'm contentious in Ireland. I once described Ireland as the doormat on which large companies wiped the, uh, their feet of their profits and left them behind to be taxed at a very low rate. That isn't a model to copy. The Irish economy is in a mess. I know it's running a massive financial surplus right now, but the reality is that's dependent upon about four companies paying a great deal of tax. We don't want to go back to the days where Ravens, Craig and other such organisations were totally driving the Scottish economy. The Limwood car plant we've mentioned before, Alex, and so on. No, we need to go to a situation where there's a strong, vibrant, mixed economy. So if we're looking for models, we need to look at those countries which are embracing that from Scandinavia, but also some of the models of Eastern Europe, where some people are beginning to think that way. We've got to break away from the Anglo-American view that finance drives the economy and go back to value creation instead. And uh, <clears throat> will you keep uh, charting the way for Scotland uh, uh, from, uh, from your uh, ivory tower down south with your Irish antecedents, Professor Murphy? I've, I've got really hooked into the whole idea that Scotland should be an independent country. I mean, I couldn't not, could I? I mean, if it was in 1916 and I was in Ireland, I would have been in favour of an independent country. How can I therefore not be in favour of Scotland having the benefit that Ireland's obtained for itself? It must, it should, it will eventually get it. Professor Richard Murphy, thank you so much for joining me on Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Thank you. What an episode of uh, Scotland Speaks this has been. My two favourite economists in one programme. You know, Danny Blanchflower, in terms of serious economic figures, has been the one who has concentrated his economic thoughts on the lives of real people. Uh, rather than pursue uh, obtuse economic theories or look for economic aggregates or, or, or search for some uh, magical potion which would bring uh, regularity to the economy, Danny Blanchard has studied economics in terms of its impact on, on human beings. It's a, a wisdom that first came to by the founder of economics, Adam Smith, and which he, more than any other contemporary economist, carries forward. He sets out a, a world scene when we have the Western world, at least, run by a bunch of central bankers who seem to have no idea whatsoever uh, of the impact of their policies uh, uh, across millions of people. They, they seem totally cocooned in their self-satisfied, extremely rich environment uh, where they pursue economic orthodoxy at the cost of real output and real people. In contrast, uh, Professor Richard Murphy <coughs> has concentrated his economic arguments uh, on the cause of Scotland. Uh, yes, of course, he pursues a very distinguished career in, uh, in accountancy, but his economics uh, analysis has been concentrated on the Scottish fiscal and monetary position. So when Richard Murphy tells us that GERS is, as he put it, crap, we should listen because nobody has done a better job of demolishing uh, the nonsense behind the government expenditure and revenue statement for Scotland. And very few economists have been more articulate in setting out the case for an independent Scottish monetary policy now that the Brexit has happened and Scotland has to find a, its own way within Europe and the wider world. A lot of people in Scotland, some Scottish nationalists, seem reasonably happy with the state of the Scottish economy, which is extraordinary, uh, because we have a, a country which should be covered in prosperity and hope, which is instead layered by uh, despair and poverty. 
Uh, but the poverty that really matters in terms of not changing economic policy is the poverty of imagination. And that, unfortunately, is there in abundance in Scotland at the present moment. We need an economic policy, which, as Danny Blanchard would say, impacts on real people. We need uh, economists and politicians who are in touch with the, the prospects of their fellow human beings. And above all, we need ambition for the people of Scotland. Uh, we need to look forward to mobilising the resources of this country for the betterment of the people of this country. Uh, and when we, we do that and see that, we'll do a lot worse than to listen to the words of Professor David Blanchflower and Professor Richard Murphy. And with that, and sadly, we come to the end of part one of this show on Scotland's economy. But worry not, we'll be back next week with part two, when we look at some of the opportunities Scotland has in a number of different sectors, where we speak to some independence-minded politicians. But until then, don't forget to send us in your tweets, messages and emails in response to this week's show. And of course, remember, you can watch us every Thursday at nine o'clock on Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, Apple Podcasts and Spotify. So we look forward to seeing you next week. Until then, from all of us at the show, goodbye, take care, stay safe and we'll see you then. This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond.